Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I think even in Georgetown, you can say Bismillahirrahmanirrahim after the Catholic University. I do so when I lecture in Washington itself. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Kamrava, whom I had known before, but we corresponded together. And my very dear old friend, Professor Patrick Lord, whom I've known for decades. He was one of my very close colleagues and also shares the same spiritual and intellectual universe with me. Uh, when requested to give this distinguished lecture, for which I'm grateful to you and I'm honored to be here, uh, I thought and thought uh, what I would speak about, and on purpose, I decided on the question of the environment for reasons that I shall clarify for you very quickly. When you look at the surface of the earth, this area of the world seems to be very barren. If you look under the sea, one of the richest ecological sites of the world is to be found just a few miles from here under the water. It's one of the great wonders of the world. That is the diversity of ecological forms, of fishes, and uh, sea life of all kinds, which stretch actually from this region here to Bandar Abbas and Hormuz and the islands south of the Persian, uh, Persia and north of the Persian Gulf, uh, the land from which I come myself, your northern neighbor. And I thought it would be a very good occasion to speak about the question of Islam and the protection of the environment. Uh, I was one of the very first people to predict the environmental crisis when no one ever spoke of it. In 1966, I gave the Rockwell Series Lectures at the University of Chicago, which predicted the environmental crisis and came out as a book later on as Man and Nature before anybody else wrote about it from this point of view. And I believe from that time on, and even before that, that what later on the Norwegian philosopher Nas Ernst uh, Nas Ernst, who just died a short time ago, Ars Nes, excuse me, uh, who invented the term deep ecology, was not really sufficient in every respect by deep ecology because a deep, deep ecology is that which really concerns me. Uh, I had a very uh, strange and perhaps unique uh, experience in life. First of all, being born and brought up in Iran, the Tehran of that time, which was really a vast garden, with the Mount Damavand Peak, which is the biggest peak in Western Asia, overlooking it, and spending the summers at its foothill with my family, always very closely attached to the beauty of nature, and then going to a place as ugly as MIT, uh, where, physically speaking, uh, where I studied physics, and mathematics, and soon realized there's something very, very wrong with, with what's going on. There's going to be a major crisis because there's a disconnection between what we consider nature to be and what we consider science to be and what it really is. And they're in the process of trying to so-called progress and dominate over the world of nature, we're first of all going to destroy ourselves. I want to come back, because the only opportunity I have to speak in Doha, to impress upon all of you, there's nothing as important in the world as the environmental crisis, nothing. Because if we don't have a natural world to live in, economic consideration, political considerations, even the worst kind of atrocities that we just observed a couple of weeks ago, which makes the blood curdle in the veins of anyone who has the least amount of conscience, can match the global significance of the environmental crisis. And it's very, very sad that whenever something happens, that is put on the so-called back burner. In fact, uh, that is itself a catastrophe for all of us. As soon as the economy goes bad, which is usually good for the fishes of the sea and the birds of the air, 
we immediately divert our attention from what, what is absolutely essential to these other problems, thinking that once we solve those problems, we'll turn back to it. In fact, all these are intertwined. We live in a world which is based really on falsehood, a falsehood of who we are and what the world is. This is not a lecture in metaphysics. I would have been very glad to give one. I've devoted my life to it. But I want to concentrate on one aspect of this reality, which is the world of nature, and especially emphasize that those who live in Qatar and areas nearby have a very, very special responsibility for protecting one of the most important areas of the whole globe from the point of marine biology and the ecology of the whole world. We think, so, so what if uh, a few fishes disappear and the coral reefs wither away somewhere far away in Australia or in the Persian Gulf? Actually, they determine the quality of the air that we breathe. And the plankton themselves determine the whole equilibrium of life on Earth. These little creatures we hardly ever see when we go swimming in the ocean. So let's understand, first of all, that this is subject of the gravest importance. And it's not going to be solved by cosmetics, which is what we're doing all the time. Namely, the patient has cancer so, and the skin has turned yellow, so we just put some powder on it and think we've solved the problem. The problem is much more profound than that. It requires really a changing of our way of life, the way we look at the world, the way we look at ourselves, of course, ultimately, the way we look at reality with the capital R. Because how we live and how we act, whether we accept or negate the divine reality is determined by our relation to the absolute, the divine reality. And that's why the question of Islam comes into play. This is a part of the world which is not only part of Dar al-Islam, but at the very heart of it, just a few miles away from the sacred cities of Mecca, Medina. I mean, when you look at geographic, uh, geographically, this region of the Islamic world is at the very heart of a world that stretches from Senegal to Malaysia and southern Philippines and north and south and to many other regions. And so I want to discuss uh, why Islam is important, not only important but crucial for those people living in this part of the world, not necessarily Buddhists in Burma or Confucians in China or Christians in Ireland, for facing this absolutely essential problem. We have a large number of Muslims in the world today whose faith is very strong. Islam remains among all the religions of the world along with Hinduism, perhaps the two religions which are most intensely followed by their uh, followers as far as rights are concerned, performance of various sacred duties, uh, much more so than many other religions. But most Muslims are not aware that there's a relationship between their daily prayers and their paying of zakat and performing the sharia and what they're doing to the natural environment. This disconnect has come from the rise of a very strange but also powerful force that came into the Islamic world in the 19th century, which I have to deal with very, very briefly because that's also a subject for another day. And that is what I could call scientism. Uh, that is a way of generalizing the view of modern science so as to embrace the whole of reality and considering it to be the determining factor for understanding what reality is. This is really what scientism entails. Uh, it's strange that scientism came to the Islamic world through the back door. And it came mostly through, the, through Istanbul and Egypt and Cairo, those two cities, and later on Bombay, other places where there are Muslim, uh, either majorities or minorities in the subcontinent of India, and then spread to the heartland of the Islamic world and to both Persia and the Arab world and inner parts of the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> Scientism began with the attempt by a number of Muslim thinkers who thought they were very devout 
and who wanted to save the Islamic world during the colonial period from the onslaught of the West, which was then militarily much more powerful than it, and it remains so to this day, of course, by equating the Islamic understanding of knowledge, al-ilm, with modern science, and saying that essentially Islam is the foundation of modern Western science, and all Muslims have to do is to learn Western science and technology. They'll be able to throw out the colonial powers and have a very happy life, eradicate all the problems of poverty, shortness of food, and this and that. Everyone will be happy. And to this end, uh, even commentaries were written upon the Quran, including the famous commentary of an Egyptian scholar called Al Iskandarani, obviously from Alexandria, a voluminous work called A Tafsir al Almi, scientific commentary, which set the tone for a large number of works that were to come out after that. And practically every single so-called Islamic reformer, every Muslim thinker who had the future of Islamic world in mind and thought they were combating the influence, the withering influence of another civilization upon the religion, it was accepted by them. When you look at the writings of Muhammad Abdo, when you look at the writings of even Sayyid Qut, I knew Sayyid Qut personally when I was a young man at Harvard, the head of the Harvard Islamic Society, when I was invited by the American government to come to America. One afternoon we had a big debate about this matter. Uh, Badi Uzzaman Nursi, the famous uh, Turkish thinker, whose follower Fatullah Gülen, now residing in Pennsylvania, has over a million followers. And I could go down the list. Even Sir Muhammad Iqbal, the most intelligent of these reformers, whom I usually call deformers, uh, uh, because they're deformed without knowing it, the integral tradition of Islamic thought, and going down the line, uh, they all thought that the great service they could render to Islam would be to combine Western technology with Islamic ethics. And to that end, many institutions were established and it's not accidental that most of the extreme Islamic movements of the 20th century have arisen from people with an engineering background in the Islamic world. This is not by any means accidental. The humanities were cast aside as being irrelevant and Western science and technology were taught, added to the Sharia with a very, very big vacuum in between. And nowhere does one see this more than in the Wahhabi world in Saudi Arabia, which for a while during the 1930s resisted, in fact, uh, the uh, open uh, espousal of American and European technology. But between 1960 and 1980, uh, we are witness to the largest transfer of technology from one civilization to another in the history of the world, what took place in the introduction of Western technology into Saudi Arabia uh, without any intellectual resistance to what to do. In fact, there was no intellectual substance in order to to resist because everybody thought as long as you said your prayers at the right time and didn't drink wine, you were good Muslims and the fact that everything else was coming in was something quite natural and normal. And this is not unique to Saudi Arabia you have in the whole spectrum of Islamic thought, from the Islamic Republic of Iran to the Saudi Kingdom, from uh, secularized Turkey to religious Sudan, and so forth and so on, everything in between, there's one common denominator, and that is a kind of worship of modern technology and science. I reside in the United States now. Therefore, I have the freedom to say things that many Muslim scholars living in the Islamic world would be afraid to say. I have made a scathing criticism uh, in my own country of this new worship of science in place of God. Most Muslims really don't worship God. They, they worship modern technology without knowing it, unfortunately. They have a correct niyyah, they have a correct intention, but the net result is that. And that's why you get the latest gadgets of, of Western technology in the Islamic world so rapidly. That's why you, when you're circumambulating around the Kaaba, you hear telephone, cell phones ringing. I mean, that's just something unimaginable. But that's because of this background 
that was established and which makes our task so much more difficult. Uh, I suffer a lot, but I should mention this, that I was perhaps the first Islamic thinker to oppose this because I knew Western science better than any of these men. I'd studied at the best institutions in the United States. I'd studied in Europe, and nobody could tell me, oh, you don't know anything, anything, anything at all about physics, and stop talking about it. Uh, but when I first began to speak about this, I was a single voice. Gradually, I trained many students, many people read, and now there is this other voice in the Islamic world which understands that the environmental crisis for the Islamic world is based on a blindness to Islamic teachings about nature, about the sciences of nature, about the goal of knowledge, why we know. And to substitute for that a purely secularist view of the world in the name of religion even is not going to solve the problem. We are faced therefore with a very, very important uh, task the task of clearing the ground, having the courage to challenge governments who, in fact, uh, also have good intentions from their point of view. They simply want to strengthen themselves, even when they're good governments, forget the bad governments, uh, of wanting to create more wealth for their people, be militarily more strong, do this, do that, but all on the basis of a technology which has come from the West and which is killing us all, literally. Global warming is only part of it. During this one hour that I shall have the pleasure of spending with you, many species will have disappeared from the surface of the earth. And no scientist can tell you how many species will disappear before the whole ecological balance is destroyed in the world. It's incredible how much is based on not knowledge but ignorance. And that's why so many formulations change every five years. It took a long, long time for the scientific establishment to even become interested in this issue. But now it has become interested. Then it took eight years for the American government to deny the reports of the very scientists who were enabling big planes to be made which could bomb anywhere in the, in the world. Uh, and uh, that wasted another eight years of the life of the Earth. And nothing serious was done, as you all know from the Kyoto protocol down the line, and uh, we still are turning the first uh, bent of the first street. So let me turn in this very difficult situation, my, the way I speak like this in so these extreme terms is not simply to be poetical, but to awaken us to what is really going on. Let me turn to what the answer of Islam would be to such a situation. <coughs> Let me start with the word environment. The word environment, uh, one of its translations into Arabic and Persian is muhit, from the word hata, which means to encompass. Uh, and it happens to be one of the names of God, who are Allah Kulisha in muhit. Ultimately, God is the environment for a true Muslim. God is the very environment within which we function, into which we're born, within which we live, and in which we die. So already we have to begin from a very, very different premise. Secondly, everything in the natural environment is created by God, we all believe, as do Christians and Jews and other religious people. Even people do not believe in creation like the Confucians and the Taoists believe that the Tao is the principle of the world of nature. They don't have the idea of the creative act, but the net result is really the same. It's a global phenomenon. It's not unique to Muslims by any means. In fact, almost everything I say has a kind of dimension in the perennial wisdom that has dominated over human life for so many millennia. Uh, anyway, to come back to the case of Islam, there is a, a creative process. The creative process is carried out by the absolute being whose pure intelligence, pure love, pure care, all the divine names that we associate with God, Ar-Rahman, Al-Khaliq, and so forth and so on, but we don't think about all the time. What does that mean? That means every creature 
has a relationship with God independent of us. Every creature has its own rights. It is this that Ernst Ness, the famous Norwegian philosopher, was considered to be the papa, grandpapa of uh, deep ecology, is really referring to what he, he says all he used to say all the time was that creatures have their own rights. Now this is nothing uh, new in Islamic thought. Always the word haq, which is translated to so many different words, one of which is do, rights. Everything has its due. Everything has its rights, including us. But we're not the only creatures to have, to have rights. We cannot overlook the dues or rights of others just for selfish purposes of our own. This is an Islamic, but we hardly ever think of it in these terms. For example, we have the right of slaughtering an animal ritually. Its meat becomes halal and we will eat it. But we do not have the right to kill an animal and waste and throw the carnage in the desert. That's against the Sharia, it's against Islamic law. Some people do it, of course. Not all Muslims follow all of Islamic law all the time. They didn't say that this is not the case, human beings being what they are. But uh, we must understand that everything has its due. And everything has a face turned toward God independent of us. There are many beautiful poems in Persian, Arabic, Urdu, Turkish, and all Islamic languages, which bring out most eloquently this truth. I'll just quote one of them, since I'm a Persian, a Persian poem by Jalaluddin Rumi. It says, Koshki hasti zabani dashti. If only being had tongues so it could lift the veil from all things that exist. And there are many verses like that. Uh, nature speaks to God. God speaks to things. Uh, he directly gives them the powers that they have, the life that they have. We do not give the life. We can inject them in a laboratory and do this and that, but we cannot bestow life on even the poor mice who have been using, used for experiments. Uh, it, the life is given by God, and each being has a face turned towards God. Secondly, uh, nature reveals itself to us according to who we are. It's not simply objective knowledge, as modern science says. Yes, that's an aspect of nature. Whether you are a good man or a bad man, a religious man or an atheist, the structure of salt is sodium and chlorine. I would the last person deny that. But the reality of that salt is not exhausted by this chemical analysis. Nature is irreducible to its purely quantitative measurable, dissectable, analytical aspect. And to do so is to destroy what is in fact most precious in nature, which is to convey to us a message. Nature is like the Quran in a certain sense. For thou over a thousand years, Islamic thinkers spoke about the Quran that I carry in my pocket, you carry in pocket, the Quran al Tadwini, the Quran that is Mudawan, that is written and bound and we carry, and Quran al Taqwini, that is the whole of creation, which itself is also Quran, each page of which reveals a truth, however, a truth which we do not understand unless we accept the first Quran in the same way that the truth of the first Quran is not understood by the person who doesn't have faith in the Quran. Obviously, there needs to be a kind of attachment to that message in order to understand the message. But the idea that the world of nature is a revealed book, like revealed scripture, and in fact, it's its counterpart, is very, very significant. Because, coming back to the case of Islam, for us, the Quran is sacred. It's not divine, only God is divine, but it's the word of God. It's sacred. 
When we carry it, we carry it with great uh, courtesy and politeness. If those of us who try to be more pious, we make our ablutions before even touching the Quran. The Quran says, No one touches except the pure. We try to draw laws from it. We kiss it and pass under it when we're going on a journey. When our daughters get married, we, they open it up in front of them to Surah Yusuf or someplace like that when the nikah, the marriage is taking place and so forth and so on down the road. Everything about the Quran for us Muslims is sacred. The parchment of which is written, the air through which the oral Quran reaches our ear and everything in between. Now, if we look at it in this way and try to transfer the sense of the sacred to the other book, we will already gain a very big step towards our goal. That is to consider nature as sacred. I've had oftentimes debates with many, many of my Muslim friends. So, oh, what you're saying is pantheism and so forth. Absolutely not. I never said that nature was divine. I said nature is sacred. The sacred, which is a word of name of God again, Al-Quddus, one of the names of God, is the sacred. Flow, this quality flows through the world of creation, through nature. In the same way that the divine mercy, our Rahma, uh, flows through all of creation, to the extent that many great Islamic sages considered the very substance of God's creation, the world of nature, to be Nafas al Rahman, the breath of the compassionate, Ar Rahman, with a capital R, that is Ar Rahman, God as, as the merciful. So, divine mercy. Uh, compassion flows through the arteries of the universe. So does sacral quality. Uh, In everyday ordinary experience of Muslims who were not philosophers or theologians or metaphysicians, it was always uh, this question that this or that has baraka to it, has a baraka to it. That's the same thing, uh, that, that things have baraka. And they have baraka, a word which is untranslatable into English, because it means that once grace, a fusion of grace, and many other words of this kind, is one of the untranslatable words of the Arabic language. I've tackled it myself for decades without really finding a perfect translation for it. Perhaps someone who knows English better than I will be able to do so one day. But anyway, the baraka, you will all understand, even those who are Americans and teaching here, you've heard this word all the time, flows through the arteries of the universe. And so we have to redevelop the idea that nature is sacred. Now we use the Quran, we use the Quran as source of law, as inspiration, a source of ethics, and we use it physically as sacred presence. We put it in a room, in a place of honor, and so forth and so on. In the old days, in most Islamic cities, there used to be a gate and inside which there was a Quran. And anyone who entered the city, whether he liked it or not, passed under the Quran. There are many Qataris who bought the beautiful gardens of Shiraz, at least in the old days, you know, as you know, even today when you enter the city of Shiraz, there's a Quran gate. And you have no choice but to go under the Quran in order to enter the city. Now we use the Quran in so many ways, the source of Islamic calligraphy, of art, in the deeper sense, the source of Islamic architecture, many, many other things. Now, nature also we use. We cannot live without nature. Uh, God has placed it there. In fact, the Quran says so in order for us to use it. But to use it uh, wisely in such a way as not to destroy it. The Quran goes to the extent, this is a remarkable verse, saying that the creatures that creep on the earth, dab, and the birds that fly in the air, tire, they are like you, Ummah. They are like you, a people. That is, when we see these birds chirping away in our garden or in the porch of our house, they're people like us, God's people. We have Ummah Muhammadiyya, Ummah Musawiyya, Ummah Isawiyya, all the different prophets have their Ummah. God has also created each species of his own creation as a people, as an Ummah. And therefore, we have to treat it as such. 
the ref- teachings of the Sharia are extremely important, of course, for everything Islamic. When it comes to the revival of the Islamic understanding of nature, total understanding of nature, within which then we must function, including how do we use technology, architecture, so forth and so on, uh, the Sharia is not uh, the only aspect of Islam. And this is very, very important to mention. I want to deal with this in greater detail. There's no sacred scripture in the world with the possible exception of the Tao Te Ching, the sacred scripture of Taoism, which speaks as much about nature as the Quran does. If you listen, you look carefully, sometimes the Quran swears by the pomegranate, by zaytun, by the olive. Uh, various plants are part and parcel of the Islamic revelation. A spider protects the life of the Prophet when he goes into the cave with Abu Bakr, otherwise there would have been no Islam. And the created element participates in the Quranic revelation. It's very important to understand that. And it's, this goes back to the Quran itself. They talk all the time about Najm, uh, stars, the sun, the moon, the trees, the water. The water itself needs a major lecture to, to discuss. Uh, the Quran, in a sense, seems to be revealed not only to human beings, but to the whole cosmos. And certainly, the Islamic cosmos participates in the Quranic revelation. I remember once in 1961, at the end of 1961, all the planets were coming into a conjunction uh, at the beginning of Aries. And people who followed astrology, especially in India and among the Druze in Lebanon, they all had gone on top of mountains expecting the world to come to an end, because it corresponded to the configuration at the beginning of the last historical cycle of Hindu cosmology, the Yuga, the Kali Yuga. And uh, it just happened that that very night, I was arriving in Cambridge, Massachusetts to begin a term as a visiting professor at Harvard. And I had a very uh, a friend who was very funny. He was a Catholic traditionalist. I said, look, I wish so much I could, I could be in Iran. What's going to happen by tomorrow? He said, would you prefer to uh, have a Muslim mountain fall upon you or, or any ordinary mountain? I said, I'll take a Muslim mountain any day, uh, <laughs> jokingly. But it's in the consciousness of traditional Muslims that uh, Islam is not confined to the shorta and to the laws and to the qadi. It also is involved with the sky, with the earth, with the creatures that abound everywhere. The Quran is not a book of modern science. That is the great mistake of all of these tafasir al-almi. Even Maurice Bakai, the famous French doctor who converted to Islam on the basis of the fact that he said that the statements in the Bible that refer to scientific facts are false, those that refer to, are referred to Quran are true, therefore I'm becoming uh, a Muslim. This is a totally false argument. It is, if I could reduce it to an Aristotelian syllogism, it would be science is true. The Quran conforms to science, therefore the Quran is true. When you put it in this syllogistic term, you find out how absurd that is. I mean, read these early 20th century, late 19th century Quranic commentaries of trying to explain whether this verse correspond to what Lavoisier said about oxygen and hydrogen, that other verse about what Louis Pasteur said, and this is Newtonian second law of motion and so forth. It looks so absurd because now all of those have changed. It is the permanent has been reduced to the changing. So it's not that about which I'm speaking. And I stand totally opposed to this idea of reducing the Quran to the science of the day. And in this way, aggrandizing the Quran. And this is a form of idolatry, of the worst kind of which we are not aware. How many Muslims have you heard say or write? Uh, Islam is great because it contributed to Renaissance science. And Renaissance science in the West led to modern science. Which means that what we have in mind is that modern science is great. So whatever contributed to it is great. The grant of Islam, that's the cause of it.
That's absurd. That's total absurdity. Civilization, the things like that dies. It's not worth to live. It's not going to survive. Because it means it has committed suicide intellectually. It no longer can, can stand on its own feet intellectually. And I, so I do not have that in mind. But it is a very profound cosmology, if I set up cosmology, in the Quran, which over at least 1,300 years of the 1,430 years of the life of Islam since we began counting with the migration of Ali Salam to Medina, uh, over this very, very long period, served as the basis for the development of various sciences, which are remarkable from the point of any civilization. For 800 years, Islam produced more mathematics and astronomy and physics and uh, medicine and pharmacology and so forth than any other civilization in the world, including the Chinese, which was also very active, and including the Western, up to the period of the Renaissance. That's a very long time. The West has also be, only been dominant for 400 years. We shall see what happens in the next 400 years. So I'm not trying to belittle that. But all of these different Islamic schools of science, sometimes not the same, de debating with each other. There was tremendous intellectual freedom in, in classical Islamic civilization. People opposed each other on many, many, many issues, from the question of causality, structure of matter, and so forth and so on. You had debates between people like Al-Biruni and Ibn Sina, two of the greatest figures of the history of science, against each other. But, but all of these were, in one way or another, related to the cosmologies that issued from the Quran. It is not accidental that not a single Muslim scientist became an atheist. It isn't that they were more stupid than Richard Dawkins, who, uh, or people like him, and they think they're very smart, and anyone who's smart is an atheist called the brights by them, and anyone who, like myself, believes in God is stupid. Uh, these, no one can read Ibn Sina's Kitab al-Shafa and think he's more stupid than Richard Dawkins, obviously. Uh, but these men function within a cosmology at the center of which was always God. And the Quran permitted the development of all of these different kinds of sciences and cosmologies, extremely wealthy scientific tradition, without alienating human beings from the world of creation, which is what, of course, modern science and technology have done. They've alienated ourselves by allowing us, first of all, to build uh, an artificial ambience in which it's easy to forget God. In the old, it was, imp it was impossible. In the biggest cities, you would walk two, three blocks, you'll be in the countryside. Atheism is born from the city. No nomad has ever been an atheist. It's our export to the rest of the globe. And to allow the creation of an atmosphere in which one can function without thinking about God. When one is in the world of nature, it's very, very difficult to be an atheist. Very, very difficult. So the Quran is the primary source, provided it is not misconstrued by those who think they're rendering a great service to Islam by not really knowing what modern science is, by not, not really knowing its consequences, by not really knowing that Islam cannot accept any science in which the hand of the supreme cause, that is God, is cut off from that science. No matter how many times you say our prayers, go to noon prayers, and that's irrelevant to the nature of the science, and then, of course, the technology that flows from it, which is its application, and now is causing such a devastation for us. Then, of course, with the Quran comes the Hadith and the Sunnah of the Prophet, the wants of the Prophet. We know very well that the Prophet loved animals, especially cats. Since I'm a very great cat lover myself, <laughs> I will only repeat to you a wonderful, wonderful letter I received from the great British poet, Kathleen Rain, the greatest woman poet of the English language of the 20th century, who died a few years ago, we were friends, and she also loved cats. I'd given a le lecture in London at Temis Academy on the subject of nature. And she wrote me, she said, oh, Dr. Nass, your lecture was so wonderful. Yes, you're right. It, nature has fallen. But of course, don't forget the cat, which has never fallen. It's in, in the perfect state that God created it. Uh, I, we know how much the prophet loved cats. 
how respectful he was of other animals, how he treated animals gently. It's on the basis of his sunnah that Islam was the first civilization to develop hospitals for animals. We do not have in ancient Greece, as far as we know. Of course, there were individuals who loved animals. There's no doubt about that. But the whole hospital you had in Aleppo, you had in uh, Cairo, you had in Persian cities for animals, and all of the promulgation in the Sharia of how to deal with animals as a burden, how to not overdo it, how to be kind to them. Unfortunately, many Muslims do not listen. But the part of the Hadith deals with direct instructions of how to deal kindly, not only with your wife and daughters and brother, but also with animals. And the Prophet, as I said, was always very much aware of this. Secondly, the Prophet loved nature. Let's not forget, it was not in a room, but in a cave that the first revelation came to him. In the cave of Al-Hara, uh, on top of Jabal al-Nur, three kilometers from the Kaaba, which is in the middle of Mecca, where the first revelation, Iqra, came there. And the Prophet loved to retire to the, to the desert, loved to be under the stars and feel the wind, the breeze, which is like the divine name when you are in the middle of a desert, breezing through you. Uh, and he himself in his own life was always a great lover and admirer of nature. And there are many hadiths that uh, people should collect in the same way they've collected hadiths on, let's say, adab, of how to eat how to greet all of the other things that we try to follow on the basis of his instructions, also how to deal with the rest of the world of nature. Of course, the prophet did not write how to deal with an octopus. I mean, that was not part of the natural scene of the Mecca or Medina of that time, but the principles are there of the care for nature. Then we come to what is the richest source and most accessible source of these teachings. And this I add very briefly. The Quran is too sublime for an ordinary Muslim, no matter how good is the Arabic, to read it and get all of the meanings without the tradition that followed through. This new movement in Egypt called the Koranite movement, just arrested some of them the day before yesterday and threw them into prison. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know why they're doing this, but what they're say, doing is false. It's as if I, since I know English, I begin to write on anthropology because all the books on anthropology are in English. I say, I can read, understand this book perfectly well, not to talk about quantum mechanics that I haven't told a little bit about, but something I don't know anything at all about. Just knowing Arabic is not sufficient. So over the centuries, on the basis of the Hadith, which was the first commentary upon the Quran, the first commentary upon the Quran is the Hadith. Let us not forget that. But then all the other commentaries that gradually build up on the basis of the oral tradition and all the different wisdom literature, they grew this vast body of literature which cuts across different theological and Shariite schools of Islam. That is Sunni and Shiite, Mu'tazilite and Asharite, uh, Sufi and Hanbalite, uh, even in Bithaymiya. Uh, may God help him. Uh, all of these uh, schools, except for modern Wahhabism, which has a total disregard for this aspect of the teachings of Islam, it concentrates on la ilaha illallah's truth, but is not interested in presence. That's why Mecca has been now turned into Manhattan very soon. Total, total uh, lack of respect for Islamic architecture because it seems to be irrelevant to Islam. I'm not talking about that. These are not mainstream schools of Islamic thought. If there are any Wahhabis in the room, you forgive me. Uh, but that's how I see it. It's too late in life to be just polite. Uh, but the main schools of Islamic thought, from Ibn Sina to Ghazali, who was his opponent, from Ibn Arabi to Fakhreddin Razi, who wrote against him. And if you know the intellectual traditions of Islam, there's very, very uh, diverse schools of thought that existed throughout the Islamic world. There is contained within them an incredibly rich philosophy of nature, or theology of nature, if I may call it. And that is, and they're all based ultimately on the Quran. They're all based on, ultimately on la ilaha illallah. 
and therefore of great value. Some were written by outstanding scientists. I just mentioned Fakhreddin Razi. He was the greatest Sunni theologian of the Ghazali, but also was a very famous doctor, remarkable uh, scientist, and uh, many others who were not scientists, but there were people who were thinkers, who were philosophers, and many of them were great poets. Uh, some of the greatest sources of the Islamic understanding of nature comes from poetry. Besides the quality of poetry, the power of poetry, to take us out of our ordinary consciousness and present us with the truth that's in another world, but at the same time here. Uh, there are many didactic forms of poetry. I just recited one from the Masnavi for you. I could recite many, many other poems that I want to give you a headache. Uh, but this is also a very rich source of uh, learning and devising a contemporary Islamic philosophy and theology of nature. And then we come to the Sharia. I said that the Sharia cannot be the only source for the, this philosophy of nature about which I speak, but it's extremely important at certain levels. Unfortunately now, a number of Islamic countries are beginning to pay attention to this. Examples. The Prophet himself drew a harim uh, around Mecca and Medina, which was not only a religious harim that non-Muslims could come into, it was also a kind of national park. That is, the creatures were protected. You were not supposed to hunt and kill and burn and so forth and so on. It was really the first idea of a national park that we have comes from him and uh, the teaching of the Sharia, for example, of, uh, that is forbidden to burn trees even during a war. You must not destroy orchards. What was done in Palestine is against Islamic law, uh, putting everything else aside. It's just like kids, killing women and children. It goes along the same, same line. You must not destroy life. You must keep water pure. How strange it is we have some of the dirtiest water in the world in Islamic cities. That's not as a result of the teachings of Islam, as a, as a result of not following the teaching of the Sharia and the very rapid migration of people from the countryside who don't, no longer feel home when they come into a big city. You'll never find a child in a village uh, in Iran or Egypt countries, which I know very well, who would walk in his own village and take a branch of a tree and just cut it off and throw it to the ground. Whereas as soon as the mayor of, let's say, Tehran or Cairo plants a tree, two minutes later some young kid comes and tries to pull the branch off. Uh, that's because he doesn't have the sense of belonging. That's another question, a sociological question. But it's against Islamic law to pollute running water. It's against Islamic law to own water as a source for a whole society. You cannot have a private a what you can have, you can have a private well in the middle of the desert, for which Arabs used to have them before the rise of Islam, and they continue to do so later. But in the cities where a large number of people benefit from water, you cannot have a private, uh, let's say, uh, water company. That was that's against Islamic law. It's against Islamic law to create a cistern for people to come and take water, as many Islamic countries have and then decide on the third month to throw some arsenic in it. So this is my uh, sister, and I want to do with it whatever I want. That, these are things are against Islamic law. The question of the protection of space of, and the privacy of space, which led to the rise of the traditional Islamic uh, urban design. You have a little part of this city. I just came from... from uh, from there taking a walk, the souq, which incorporates some of the principles of Islamic urban design, which is related to the Sharia in many, many different ways, both that and to Islamic art. Uh, and look at the amount of pollution of air inside the souq and in the big streets outside. You don't need to do anything. Next time, just take two deep breaths and you'll find out what I'm talking about. The Sharia had a lot to say. But it was not the determining factor 
The Sharia was there to set limits on our actions, to do what is good, to do what is evil, to, to do the commandments of God. But the attitude towards the world of nature, except for the prohibitions, the manhiyat, belong to the wisdom literature from which, in fact, of course, uh, came over the centuries the source and inspiration for uh, a philosophy of nature. Now, uh, the two very great difficulties that the Islamic world faces at the present moment, even if people become aware of this, which is a very big if, uh, the, the reason it's so difficult is that most Muslims, deep down, modernized Muslims, have a trust deep down in their heart that the West will take care of it. Somehow Western technology will solve everything. Uh, this is not only true of the Islamic world, but the rest of Asia. That is, the most adamant supporters of modernism in the world today are modernized Orientals. And so if you're in a place like, let's say, a major American university, where many people are skeptical that, in fact, modern technology can solve these problems. The governments are not, because they come to power on the basis of that. But uh, people who really know what is going on, many of them realize that uh, simply changing technologies is not going to solve the problem. It might, it might give us a little bit more time. The solution lies in a different way of living, in the, the way of thinking about who we are and how we live our life on Earth. But in the Islamic world, you have the double difficulty I'm thinking that deep down, Western technology knows what it's doing. We just made a few mistakes here and there, polluting its cities, and we learned from them, and of course our cities are much more polluted now than Western cities because it's really the junk from Western technology that we use uh, for the most part. Uh, Cairo is much more polluted than London. Tehran is much more polluted than Washington, obviously. But we think that somehow this problem is going to be solved this, uh, by them. It's not going to be solved by them. We, has, we have to solve it for ourselves. And uh, this cannot happen so easily because the Islamic world is under tremendous economic pressure to uh, receive from the West the crumbs from its bread table. That is to buy whatever happens to come on the market with very little resistance, that no, I don't want this, this is not good. We have to wait for the West to solve the environmental crisis and say, ah, oh, now I'm importing a car which doesn't cause global heating, uh, warming of the atmosphere, and so forth and so on. This is the very, very great problem. And therefore, uh, the Islamic world, along with other parts of the world, are at the tail end. We still haven't seen anything until all of China wants to have refrigerators, and all of them want to drive, and all of India, which you have uh, two and a half billion people who want to live like people in Los Angeles. There'd be no earth left, no globe left to, to do anything. We have to do something ourselves, and uh, the difficulty is twofold. First of all, we have to be able to reformulate and recast in a contemporary language the philosophy of nature by which we have lived for so many centuries. Not as archaeology, not as simply history, but as present-day reality. And this takes tremendous intellectual effort. It takes knowledge, know-how of both Islamic intellectual tradition and what's going on in the West, and the creative gift to be able to express that in a language which people will hear and will understand, knowing that this is an uphill battle. No government in the Islamic world wants to listen to it on the uh, macro level, maybe a little thing here, a little thing there, but nobody really wants to change the educational curriculum so the children at school begin to see a big difference in how they look at things. It's interesting that in this field, uh, the place where the environmental crisis began in earnest, and worst of all, I don't mean the Ruhr Valley and England where the Industrial Revolution began, but I mean the United States, the most powerful uh, technological society in the world. It is here, precisely because you see the effect most acutely, that in elementary schools, 
already most children are completely different from their parents. Their attitude towards animals, towards trees, towards water is totally different. Many of them, of course, the economic pressures that will come, peer pressure, will make them into Wall Street junkies sooner or later. But many of them will not. There's a change that's one of the greatest hope for humanity is precisely this. And this is the result of a number, a small number of American educators who decided to teach children at a young age to have another attitude that than was held 40, 50 years ago at school. And you grow up with that, of course. So it's not impossible, but this is one thing that needs to be done. Secondly, much more difficult, all right, now we have established this uh, philosophy of nature, theology of nature, a worldview. How to apply it? How to apply it? Uh, we cannot be uh, sort of blind idealists. It's not going to happen that we're suddenly going to have a government which is going to, from the above, do all, the, all of these things. As I said, uh, in my own country, Iran, a major revolution took place in the name of Islam, and everybody thought that uh, the Islamic view of the universe was going to dominate over everything. But it didn't. It dominated over certain things, whereas because of the need for power, I mean both electric, electric power and military power, Iran is now much more technological than before. Thirty-some years ago, I was the president of Iran's most important scientific university, Imperial University in Iran, the Arya Mir University, which is the best university in the Middle East in science and technology. I know exactly what was going on. I tried to create the Department of Humanities to veer some of these engineers away from just looking at models from the West. I had a letter just a month ago from one of the old professors, who's the, the dean there now, he said, after 35 years, your dream has come true. We started a PhD program at the center, uh, most important center of science and technology in Iran on the philosophy of science to be taught from the Islamic point of view, not simply the Western philosophy of science. But how long it will take for that to percolate down it will certainly be beyond my lifetime. So even when you have a revolution of that dimension, it doesn't mean that suddenly uh, sane environmental policies are going to be followed. All the beautiful gardens in northern Tehran are gone because human greed oftentimes wins out over wisdom. And this is not only true on Wall Street, it also happens in other places. I don't know what's going on here in this city, but all over the world you see this phenomenon. I will not talk about other Islamic countries on this issue, but I will talk about my own country. So it's very, very difficult to apply. How we apply it is where we can. I think there are major opportunities right now, for example, to change urban design, which is environmentally extremely important in the use of energy, in the pollution of the air. Already, as I stand here, there are several centers that are being built in, of all places, Washington, which are based on human beings, not the car. It's the Americans who invented the machine, the car, uh, which tears into the guts of every city and cuts in the, uh, the cities are made for cars, not for us, but just a peripheral. Uh, it's important to have a road and a parking lot uh, next to it, and then everything comes third, everything else. There are already changes that you see, and the Islamic world certainly has no excuse whatsoever with this vast uh, architectural tradition with the urban design, the fact that uh, we had a city of a million people, Neishabur, in the Middle Ages, the first city in history that we know had a million people in it. A very, very big urban center, which functioned and in which you had a lot more human connections, a lot less use of whether the machine was not around, but uh, they, they, got, they got by. The use of urban design and architecture is something that uh, we have no excuse in not doing. Uh, I'm very sad, and I don't want to make commentaries on places because it's everywhere. When you see these monstrosities, 80 uh, floors high, coming up in a peninsula in the Persian Gulf, how much energy is that going to need to run? All those windows that never open during the winter and the summer. 
and therefore get the natural heat and cold from the outside. Just sit down and calculate what this means for the Earth, and that this has been duplicated a hundred times in every city all over the world, from Sao Paulo to Cape Town and everything in between. It's not unique to the Islamic world. But we cannot wait for the whole world to solve the problems for us or for themselves. We have to do it ourselves. I feel the field of urban design and architecture is a field in which a great deal can be done. Secondly, there are many technologies, including agriculture, where the application of modern technologies are devastating and which bring much less yield, they destroy things much more quickly, they destroy the top soil, they destroy the variety of plants, and a lot of study has been made of that. Why commit suicide? Why commit suicide? Uh, let us do what we had learned over the centuries. After all, agriculture is to a large extent an experimental science. You learn through experience. It's very interesting that when we brought American experts they were supposed to be experts in everything. To Iran in the 1960s, I just come back from Cambridge, and one of them was my friend. And we brought to improve the irrigation systems around the Iranian cities. And they went to all the cities and they said, we cannot improve upon anything. The irrigation of cities like Isfahan and Yazd are masterpieces of design and just do what you're doing. They're honest enough because they're getting paid a large amount of money to change. To, but they were honest enough to say that. There are a lot of fields like that. The handicrafts, to make things with hand. They're not, not all Muslim societies have a small population like Qatar. We have societies in which are tens and hundreds of millions of people. And uh, you could bring back many of the handicrafts which are much less impact upon the environment uh, from the point of view of pollution and many other things and can be done. And finally, most important of all of these things, to not simply accept every form of technology that comes along. That is to be judicious and try to create some of our own technological forms. Once one of the best of the Iranian architects who happens to be working in the Persian Gulf now, uh, after I taught him for years and years to, uh, to do Islamic architecture, he, he did a building full of aluminum. So what is, the, what is I doing? Why did you do this? I, he saw because of this, because of that, I answered them. It was not economic, it was not anything, it was simply ego. He finally had to say because the material is there. There are a lot of things out there, but the blind use of them is because of a weakness on our part. There are those, of course, who want to make money. Greed is part of human nature. I'm not saying that greed is going to go away immediately. But there is really an awareness that is do or die, that we are faced with mass extinction and death and worst kind of catastrophes we have never thought about in our wildest imagination, then perhaps something can be done. Let me conclude by saying that for the Islamic world, no protection of the environment can come about without the revival of the Islamic view of the environment. Uh, simply to say that some Swede said so and so is not going to make people follow suit. We need to make use of our own traditions. And the fact that we have not done so, you see the results all over the Islamic world. I don't have to add any more. And I'm hoping and praying at the end of my little talk for you that uh, this little corner of the earth which is the upper part of the Persian Gulf, where God has created one of the most remarkable, ecologically diverse underground milieus. Uh, we can all get together instead of burning a Kuwait and throwing oil into the Persian Gulf, as happened some years back, to try to get together and preserve the site, no matter what, to, as a model how we can live and let live. And in the long run, there's no life for us possible unless we learn to live and let live. Thank you.